We welcome you to the program today. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to Esther chapter 8. We continue with our study of the book of Esther. We'll be studying verse by verse through the book. Verses 1 through 6, we see Esther petitioning the king for the Jews. In verse 1, on that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther, the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So on the day of the second banquet, prepared by Esther, the king ordered Haman to be hanged on the gallows. We see this back in Esther chapter 7 and verse 10. The same day, the king gave the queen the house of Haman. Following the execution of Haman, the king gave the confiscated estate of Haman to Queen Esther. We might ask, what happened to Zeresh, the wife of Haman? Well, as far as the book is concerned, the book of Esther, we are not told. Esther chapter 6, verse 13 mentioned Zeresh, the wife of Haman. The author of the book again called Haman the enemy of the Jews. He first called Haman such when he received, when Haman received the signet ring from the king in Esther chapter 3 and verse 10. Esther told the king how Mordecai was related to her. And while the king now knew that Esther and Mordecai were both Jews, she tells, she tells the king that she was Mordecai's uncle's daughter, which would make Esther a cousin to Mordecai. He brought her up after the death of her mother and father, her parents. Mordecai acted as a father to Esther. In Esther chapter 2 and verse 7, and Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. In reference to the in reference to Haman. The term translated house is used earlier to describe Haman and how he went home in Esther 5 and 10, how Haman hurried to his house in Esther 6 and verse 12, and how the gallows stood outside the house of Haman in Esther 7 and verse 9. Verse 2, so the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. The king gave his signet ring to Mordecai, which was taken from Haman. When was the ring taken from Haman? Well, most likely it was taken around the time that they covered Haman's face before they hung him on the gallows in Esther chapter 7 and verse 8. The queen appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman, the king had given the house of Haman to her, and now she set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Verse 3. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman, the Agagite, and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And so at the second banquet, Esther finally made her request to the king. If you remember, back in Esther 7, 3 to 4, then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request, for we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, 
I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. Now, as of yet, the king had not yet granted her request. There's a reason for that. We see that he had hung Haman on a gallows, but there was still danger for Esther and for her people. The decree was still in effect. The text reads, now Esther spoke again to the king. This seems to indicate that Esther came again to the king as she did before, as before when she first came without being called to petition the king for her people. That was back in Esther chapter 5, 1 to 2. Remember how she pointed out that everybody knew that if anybody came uninvited or un uncalled to the king, that it was, it was death. She took a risk in going to him. She took a, another risk in going to him a second time, un unannounced, uninvited, un summoned. And so Esther fell down at the feet of the king, and she earnestly requested, as she wept, that the king counteract the evil scheme of Haman to destroy the Jews. And so counteract or advert or put to an end this evil scheme or plot against the Jewish people of Persia. Verse 4, and the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. And so the king hold, held out the golden scepter before Queen Esther. She would not be punished for coming to the king without being called. As per the custom, she touched the top of the scepter. As we see back in Esther chapter 5 and verse 2. And she arose from, from his feet having fallen down to implore her, to employ him. Verse 5, and said, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. Provinces, And so here in verse 5, Esther begins her request by respectfully addressing the king. She requests by the king's authority that the letters devised by Haman would be revoked. These were the letters which called for the annihilation of the Jews in all of the king's provinces, Esther chapter 3 and 13. Verse 6, for how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Esther called for the mercy of the king. She could not endure to see the evil that would come to her people because of the scheme of Haman. She could not endure to see the destruction of her own countrymen. The same term is also translated as family in Esther 2 and 10 and Esther 2 and 20. And so countrymen, or in this case, her family. The Jews were her people and her family her countrymen, Esther chapter 3 and 13. And so she beseeches the king. She pleads to him with tears, asking him to help her people. How can she endure such an evil done to her people, to her countrymen, her family? The implication is, is that she could not endure such evil done to her people. And so she pleaded with, for her people with tears. Verses 7 to 8, we see the king's response. Verse 7, Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, 
Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. Ahasuerus spoke to Esther and to Mordecai. While not mentioned earlier, we see from this verse that Mordecai was present with the king and Esther. The king told Mordecai that he had given Esther the house of Haman and that they had hanged Haman because of his evil scheme to kill the Jews. Why did Mordecai not request or make this request himself? It may have been that Mordecai thought that the request would be best from Queen Esther. After all, the king had promised to grant her request up to half the kingdom. He had made no such promise to Mordecai. The king had still not granted her request to save her people. Again, there was a reason, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, or in this case, the Persians and the Medes. Verse 8. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews, as you please, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. There's the reason. King Ahasuerus told Esther and Mordecai to write a decree themselves concerning the Jews. They could make the decree as they pleased. They could do so in the king's name. Mordecai could seal the decree with the king's signet ring, which the king had given to Mordecai. This signet ring would, would confirm the authority of the king in this matter. You see this back in Esther chapter 8 in verse 2, that the ring was given to Mordecai, which used to be used to be with Haman. According to the law of the Persians and the Medes, a royal decree could not be altered. Remember how Mimukan, the prince, advised the king? He said, if it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him and let it be recorded in the law of the Medes the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it will not be altered? Esther chapter 1 and verse 19. This is what we read in the book of Daniel, when the governors and the satraps told King Darius, Know, O king, that this, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree or statue which the king establishes may be changed, Daniel chapter 6 and 15. There might have been a good reason for this law. It may have been that the law served to, to prevent any hasty changes made to the law. So once the law was made, the law stood, and even the king could not change the law. Even the king did not have the authority to revoke a royal decree which was recorded in the law of the Persians and the Medes. However, the king suggested that Esther and Mordecai write a decree themselves and that Mordecai seal it with the king's signet ring. As far as the king's signet ring is concerned, before the fall of Haman, the king had given his ring to him. Uh, you remember how the king told Haman? that the money and the people were given to him to do with them, he said, as seems good to you, as seems good to you, Esther chapter 3 and 11. Well, now the king, who has given his signet ring to Mordecai, told Mordecai and Esther to write a decree as you please, Esther 8 and 8. And so, as seems good to you, or as you please. Literally, this is, as is good in your eyes. 
this was fine for Esther and Mordecai, but not so fine for Haman. That should never have been left up to this evil man. We see now in verses 9 to 17, the king's decree and how by the decree the Jews are avenged. Verse 9, so the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the province, provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. The king's scribes were called on the 23rd day of Sivan, which was the third month of the year. In our calendar, Sivan the 23rd would be about our June and would be about the year 474 BC, according to history. This allowed over eight months for the Jews to prepare for the upcoming assault. The scribes wrote according to Mordecai, or, to, or according to what Mordecai commanded them to write. The decree was written to both the Jews and to the non-Jews. It was written to those people and authority in the kingdom of every province. It was written to every people in their own script or writing. It was written in the language or the tongue of the people. This way the decree could be read and understood. Verse 10, and he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses, bred from swift steeds. Mordecai rode in the name of the king and sealed the document with the king's signet ring. He then sent the document in letters by couriers. The term courier is primarily is a word which meant to run. But in this context, it's used for a messenger. The idea is speed. These couriers carry the letters by horseback, riding the fastest horses of the king. There was a Greek historian by the name of Herodotus. He lived around 484 to 425 BC and he was the writer of the Persian Wars. He wrote about the Persian postal system or service, and a translation of his writings read, it is said that as many days as there are in the whole journey, as many are the men and horses that stand along the road, each horse and man at the interval of a day's journey. And these are stayed neither by snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor darkness from accompanying, accomplishing their appointed course with all speed. It may sound familiar. It may remind you of the Pony Express in the Old West of America. You may also think of the unofficial motto of the United States Postal Service, which reads, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. And so we see the similarities between the two. Something to, something to think about. But anyway, in verse 10, we see the idea of speed, that the message was sent by the authority of the king, as written by Mordecai, sent out by couriers on horseback. The idea of speed got the message out quickly. 
Verse 11. By these letters the king permitted the Jews, who were in every city, to gather together and protect their lives, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions. If you compare this to what Haman wrote by the scribes, it is very similar. This was intentional. The decree follows very closely with the decree of Haman. He ordered the destruction of the Jews, both young and old, even little children and women. He also ordered that their possessions be plundered. The order was given for the king's men. In Esther 3 and 9, the hands of those who do the work. Also in Esther 9 and verse 3. Fresher memories, uh, remember Esther 3.13 with the decree of heaven. It says, and the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy and to kill and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women in one day. On the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. As much as possible, without actually revoking the decree, which would be contrary to the law of the Persians and the Medes, without actually revoking the decree to destroy the Jews, this new decree gives the Jews permission from the king to assemble and to protect themselves. They would be permitted to, quote, destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, which would include the little children and women of those who assaulted them. They would also be permitted to plunder the possessions of their enemies. What was permitted done to the Jews was also permitted to be done to their enemies. This certainly would have the effect of of causing some hesitation on the part of their enemies, perhaps fear. We note that there's no indication in the book of Esther that the Jews acted upon the decree in destroying the children and women of their enemies. There's nothing in the book of Esther that says that they did. And while the Jews have the authority of the royal decree, when the day came, according to Esther 9 and 10, they did not lay a hand on the plunder. People who did not take the possessions of their enemies would not likely take or harm the women and the children of their enemies. The mere fact that they now too had the authority of the king to do so would strike terror in the hearts of their enemies who would assault them. So we see the similarity between the two decrees. And we see that what gave them the authority, the authority of the king, what was given to the enemies was also given to them. And so they could protect themselves. They could gather together. They could fight back. And they would not come under any retaliation from the king. Verse 12. On one day, in all the provinces of the king, Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Verse 12, we see the day appointed for the Jews to gather and to protect themselves in all the province of the king was on the 13th day of Adar. This was the 12th month. This was the same day given to destroy the Jews in the decree of Haman, back in Esther 3, 7 and Esther 3 and 13. Verse 13, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. And so the Jews were given the authority of the king to gather and to protect themselves. Esther 8.11, a copy of the 
document was published so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. They had the authority of the king to exact justification, satisfaction. Verse 14, the couriers who rode on royal horses went out and hastened and pressed on by the king's command. And the decree was issued in Shushan, the citadel. With the decree of Haman, the author wrote, the couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was published, proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. Esther 3 and 15. And so very similar to what we read in the third chapter, the 15th verse. In this passage, in Esther 8 and 14, the author described how the couriers went out. The text describes how they rode on royal horses. Earlier, we read how Mordecai sent letters by couriers on horseback, Esther chapter 8 and verse 10. The meaning is that the message was sent with haste or speed. And so they were to quickly take the letters out, to take the message to the people of all the provinces of the kingdom of King Ahasuerus. Verse 15. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. And so Mordecai departed from the king with success. The author described how Mordecai was dressed in royal apparel of blue and white. He had the blessing of the king. These were collars of royalty, blue and white, or purple. Remember how there were white and blue linen curtains in the court of the garden of the king's palace back in Esther chapter 1 and verse 6. He also wore a crown of gold on his head and a fine linen garment with purple. These also were symbols of the king. Earlier, the king honored Mordecai by having Haman parade him about on a royal horse wearing a royal robe, which the king himself had worn. Esther 6 and verse 8. There's no record that the people rejoiced or that the people were glad when Haman was in the same position that Mordecai was now in. Following the decree of Haman, according to Esther 3.15, the city of Shushan was perplexed. There was bewilderment and there was confusion. The people could not understand why he would issue such a decree for the destruction of the people of the Jews. And so there were, was perplexion, confusion, bewilderment. However, when Mordecai went out from the presence of the king, he had the blessing of the king, the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. Note the great difference between Haman and Mordecai. The people of the city of Shushan shouted in joyous celebration. It reminds me of a proverb of Solomon in Proverbs 29 and 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. I think we could see, we could see the, that in these passages. Verse 16. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. And so the Jews of the city of Shushan had light. While there was the darkness of mourning, now there was the light of rejoicing. The 
figurative usage of the term light is explained by the text as gladness and joy. We also note that they had honor. Verse 17. In every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. Verse 17, we see that the Jews had light in every province and city. With the king's command and the decree which came, the Jews had joy and gladness. They showed their happiness with a feast as a holiday. The word translated here as holiday literally means a good day. And so some versions read a good day, a holiday. The idea of celebrating their joy and gladness. About eight months later, when the Jews will have rest from their enemies, we see that they will celebrate with gladness and feasting as a holiday, Esther 9 and 19. Mordecai will write to establish an annual celebration of the holiday of the Feast of Purim, the days of Purim, we see in Esther 9, 20 to 22. And so the idea of Pur the lot or Purim, the days of Purim, Esther 9, 20 to 22. The author remarked that many of the people of the land became Jews. You might ask, what does that mean? What does he mean by that? The, many of the people of the land became Jews. Well, it appears that many became proselytes, the idea of being converts to the Jewish faith. They became Jews by their conversion. The number may also have included those who became Jews by association in that they sided or took sides with the Jews. According to the text, they became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. Fear can mean dread. Fear can also mean reverence, honor, respect, and while fear may indicate that they were afraid, the term may also be used in the sense of honor. In the previous verse, we do read how the Jews had honor. And so they had the, the joy and the gladness and the honor back in Esther chapter 8 in verse 16. He may have been referring to this, to this matter. The author called Mordecai, Mordecai the Jew in Esther 8 and 7. Remember when Mordecai came out from the king, the city rejoiced and was glad, Esther 8 and 15. Later, we will see how the people helped the Jews because, quote, the fear of Mordecai fell upon them, Esther 9 and 3. Again, Mordecai the Jew, uh, the fear of the Jews fell on the people, here in this, in Esther 9 and 3, the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. He explained, for Mordecai was great in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, became increasingly prominent, Esther 9 and verse 4. So in what way did, or since, did the people, many of the people, become Jews? Well, it appears that they became Jews as proselytes by conversion. However, some think that they became Jews merely by claim. That is, they made themselves out to be Jews. One version reads that they declared themselves Jews. So it may be, and I think, that many of the people became Jews in the sense of becoming proselytes and becoming uh, people of the Jewish faith. However, we also see, in a sense, that they did join with or side with the Jews. And so 
that might be also the sense in which it's referred that they became Jews. So that leaves us with the end of the chapter. We're done for today, and we're glad that you were able to be here and join with us in the study today. We hope that you'll be able to join us again and in the future. Lord willing, we'll be back next time with the following chapter. We appreciate our time together, and we look forward to the next time. We encourage you to continue to study on your own, and, and again, thank you for being here today.